what is up, theology nerds, or maybe I should say Bible nerds, or or homileticians, or uh, pulpit rockers, because this is the LectioCast, and uh, my name's Trip. If you are a normal LectioCast listener, you're saying to yourself, uh, where is the good Dr. Daniel Kirk? Well, he is doing a very good Dr. Daniel Kirk type of thing. He is going on a massive road trip with his family, and he's like, look, um... Do you don't want to leave the people in the lurch, do you, Trip? Do you want to step up? Do you want to use that servant's heart you have uh, and, 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 and put even more audio minutes of you talking on the Internet? I said, yeah, I'll do it. So my name's Trip. If you uh, listen to LectioCast and don't listen to any of the other homebrewed podcasts, well, come on over. Come on over. Just go to homebrewedchristianity.com. We have a weekly interview show just called Homebrewed Christianity. There's the Theology Nerd podcast where it's more like stuff with my friends where we talk and nerd out, maybe some live events or, uh, you know, things I'm more like driving theologically. There's a Lectio cast, obviously. There's the culture cast. Mm-hmm. I don't do that. Don't worry, because I basically love the 90s. Mid-90s, yep, flannel, Kevin Smith, Pearl Jam. I got that junk covered. That's, I tapped out after that. Um, <clears throat> but our friends up in Portland, the Pyatt's, uh, do the culture cast and then there's barrel age podcast which are some of the best interviews uh, that i've done because i started this in 2008 homebrewed christianity and there's a lot of podcasts like thousand interviews or so that y- you can only get like 200 on the internet so i try to release my faves back then so yeah go there hang out because today i'm going to talk to you about the bible passages for trinity sunday which is coming up june 11th trinity sunday we are we're year a in the in the year of 2017, but year A on the lectionary. And the texts are, well, the Genesis 1 creation story, Psalm 8, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, uh, which verses 11 to 13, it's very short. That's one that says you should greet each other with a holy kiss, and then it throws a three-part benediction with um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I get how it goes there because it's Trinity Sunday, but don't preach on that one. Yeah. Do the others. And then there's Matthew 28, 16 to 20. So I want to tell you something. Um, I, 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 yes, I have, a, I have a PhD in philosophy, religion, religion, and theology, and I am ordained and worked full-time at a church until about two years ago when I started working full-time at the Hatchery here in Los Angeles. It is like a, I don't know, alternative type of seminary where if you want to start something up, you do a master's in theology, learn social entrepreneurship, and launch like a common cause community. And uh, yeah, so after I started doing that here, I had the problem of not preaching regularly. And so when I get invited to speak places and things, I always look for a chance to preach. So, you know, I, I decided that, that the LectioCast, I would kind of invite you in to what I would do um, if I was handed these texts. And my thing, when I love preaching the lectionary, is... I try to take the text, I'll read it three or four times, and um, and then say, what questions is the text provoking? Because so I find stories or examples or insights or, or things to go finding more information when you dig deeper and you know, reading your commentaries and things, that they are driven, uh, for me, when preaching by the question. And that if you can find how the text confronts you, your community, the people that you, you serve, pray for, care for, uh, when you're engaging the text, then you can take that question and start to unpack it. Um, at least that's how I do it. I'm not saying you have to do it that way, but maybe that'll help you make sense of of where I go with these different texts. And so, you know, if I was preaching this Sunday, and, and it's Trinity Sunday, and maybe we'll talk about the Trinity at the end, but um, I personally don't think anyone needs a sermon on the Trinity. But if you're going to do it, do it right. You know what I mean? <laughs> don't use the egg example or the mist one, the water thing. Don't do that. Um, add lots of Greek words. That helps Trinity sermons. Uh, but, but I think you should just stick stick with one of these texts. And, you know, if for some reason uh, all of Nicaea doesn't come out of the text, then you don't have to fit it in. Maybe you'll use the creed if you're one of those types. But I would say wrestle with the text because um, uh, these are all high-quality texts other than that second Corinthians one. It's a bit boring. You know what I mean? Especially when you have Matthew, Matthew 28, the end of it. So this is the one I think I would, I would first be drawn to, right? And here you have Jesus. It's a short text, so I'm just going to read it. I don't know why Daniel doesn't read the Bible to you. 
I, I Daniel, look, I, I live the Bible. I'm going to read it. Anyway, in Matthew 28, the uh, text goes, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When he saw him, or when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. So here, here are the four, the four questions uh, that, that could send me, that send me out to wrestle with the text. All right. The first one would be, the, the question would be, where is our Galilee? I know that they've probably been looking at Matthew, right? Everyone knows the gospel of Matthew. It's like the, it's like the most popular one. Maybe John. But I think Matthew's probably the most popular. Definitely was in the early church. You got Matthew, and it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. Now, there's a number of theologians that have made this observation. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, Andrew Sung Park um, uh, are the ones that pop immediately to my head. Uh, but, you know, how did the disciples go to see the resurrected Christ in Galilee? They got directions from a woman, right? The disciples don't ever end up encountering the resurrected Christ, unless they trusted the witness of the woman who comes and like, oh, meet me in Galilee, right? That just happened a little bit ago in Matthew. Um, And it's important because Galilee was not Jerusalem where everything went down. When Jesus confronted the religious political uh, powers of that day, right, during Passion Week and such, you were in the center of power in Jerusalem. But Jesus wants to reunite with his disciples in Galilee, the outskirts of power on the side. So one of the questions that to me could really shape this, this sermon is where is the Galilee today? Where do we have to go to encounter uh, 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 Christ, the, the crucified and resurrected Christ today? I think that oftentimes um, the, the, the this text gets hung up on, you know, like the go baptize, teach them to do stuff thing, and it easily gets turned into the justification for kind of American Christianity uh, witnessing slash imperializing where you go, you have the whole truth, you're handing it to others, but for people who are, are members of Christ's body and citizens of the most powerful uh, country in the world, um, the, the question of where is our Galilee is an important one, that that's where we go to encounter uh, the risen Christ to be reunited with the one who binds us together uh, to encounter um, the God's proclamation of hope in the face of death dealing cross building power. Where's your Galilee? And you could be, um, uh, I mean, I could just think of like stories of yourself, like where you encountered someone, uh, stories in church history where going into Galilee, going to the places on the outskirts and stuff, uh, encounter and shape the mission of the church. Because once you answer that question, then what it looks like right, to, to baptize people into this body, the one that's brought back together in Galilee and not Jerusalem, is, is a powerful thing. Anyway, I'm sure you can just Google, you know, theologians, Galilee, and the outcasts, and, and really sweet stuff come up. Second one that came up is, uh, in my head is... Um, uh, the line where it says, when they saw him, they worshiped and some doubted. Can we worship and doubt together? It's a question. I think that one of the most great, the best news about this text here is you got the disciples rolling with resurrected Jesus. I mean, if you, a good time to not doubt that much is when you're actually hanging out with, with a dude with holes in his hands. You're like, well, that's Jesus, not dead. Well, well, and it says they worship, but some doubted. So in the midst of the community first called back together, encountering the risen Christ, they worshiped, yes, but some doubted, and that doubt was not something they kept to themselves. It's in the Bible. right? So I think this question could be super freeing and empowering to wrestle with and unpack that it is completely possible here on Trinity Sunday with the power of Pentecost and the celebration of Easter just behind us to say that indeed we are here, we are worshiping, and part of worshiping is recognizing, creating the hospitable space for doubt to exist. It can exist so much that you put it in the Bible. 
right? Like, I don't know. We don't know which of the disciples it was. But um, you don't put at the end the crescendo of your gospel. You know, little St. Matthew's like, saw we worship, but some doubted. You know the doubts there because the community of the risen Christ is one where doubts can be shared, and they're not yours alone, and that doesn't deflect or diminish or, 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 or disturb or genuine worship. They go together. The life of faith, any healthy faith has doubt in it, and I think you can rock that right there. You can get people to hopefully in your congregation be able to acknowledge, maybe share, or voice their doubt. Um, because when you're able to do that, when you're able to bring the questions, the pain, the stories, your struggles, and everything to worship, then you're actually able to worship uh, in, in a much deeper way. Because all of us should be welcome um, in the body of Christ. And like, not just all of us like everybody's welcome, but all of us, like all of you as an individual. Uh, a lot of us bring the parts we like, but not the parts we don't. Or the parts that have been fixed, not the parts that are still broken. We bring um, a wounds with scabs but we don't ever share them. We cover them up and stuff like that. But here, like, what it, what what it would be like to bring your whole self, doubts included, and stuff. Anyway, this third one is use the text and ask the question, what is a disciple? And this would be like one of those callback sermons. You tell the story of the different disciples, Jesus' encounter with them throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Um, the, the thing in the Gospel of Matthew is that the disciples are idiots. They get Jesus wrong all the time. Very early in the gospel, Jesus says, you know, who do they say I am? They say some stuff. Well, what do you say? Who do you say I am? And they're like, Peter's like, Jesus Christ, son of the living God. He's like, great. My dad told you. (laughs) I don't know if that's exactly. I'm just trying to translate it literally from the Greek. None the less. Um, And then you see like the disciples get the, the label right. Jesus is Lord, the Christ or whatever. But they get the content wrong. So they resist him going to Jerusalem. They resist this idea uh, that he should go, uh, that he's going to go and be uh, this non-violent engager with the principalities and powers and, and Pilate and company. Um, you got James and John are like, can you put us on your right and left when you get a, when you get a throne? And Jesus is like, I don't think you want to ask for that. He's talking about the cross, like, you know, anyway. And then Peter's like, whoa, Jesus, you're going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill you there. And Jesus smacks him. I don't know if he smacks him. In my head he does, but it's a friend smack, you know, like a, whoa, Whoa, let's get this straight. Not like a violent smack. Anyway, Jesus is like, whoa, get behind me, Satan. He's like, I thought, I'm, you look, Father said, Son of the living God to you. You got that right. Now how about you let me tell you what that looks like? Right, the Gospels are these stories where we can get the confession right. We can get Jesus as the Christ. We get the content wrong. And wouldn't it be a good time where you're dealing with this text where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you pause there, and they're like, you know, like Columbus. You know, he didn't do the greatest missionary work of all time. He, he was actually a post-millennialist, I found out. He thought, like, you, you had to get everybody saved, and then Jesus was coming back. And so, obviously, you convert or kill him. Like, this, the... It's a great time to ask what a disciple is and what are the ways in which we can be ravagely faithful and miss the content and are utterly destructive of the advance of God's kingdom. The goodness and justice and love of God, we work against it because we don't take the time to get the content and character of what it means to be a disciple and to be the church and be God's people down. That's what I'm talking about. That was what I would do with that question. There's lots of different stories and ways you can unpack it, but what I would do is do callbacks. I would, I would reintroduce the question, what is a disciple, running through Matthew, so that when Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations, and this is who you're getting baptized into, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, like when he's saying that, he is not saying, like, you're, you're empire friendly. He's not saying, finally, your denomination's the right one that figured out biblical Christianity. Um, he's inviting us to continually have our own definitions of who God is, who the Christ is, the character of God's mission, all that kind of stuff, be continually deconstructed by the community that practices Jesus' teaching and way. And that when those get deconstructed, it leads to greater faithfulness uh, among the people, among the community. So let's remember as we're ending this gospel, you know, on Trinity Sunday, what is a disciple? Let's do it. Boom. That's how I do it. Now, the fourth question I would say, how is Christ with you? Now, 
The end of the text says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I, that's easy to hear as a throwaway line for people whose life's not in crisis. When your life's in crisis or when you're on the edge of existence and stuff like that, then you want to know where is God? Is God with me and all that kind of stuff? But Jesus just says, I am going to be with you always to the end of the age. So then turn it back around. Where is Christ with you now? Part of the challenge, the difficulty of living, um, especially as a Christian, is, is cultivating eyes that are attuned to the presence and activity of God in the midst. So like you could think of all the different ways uh, that God's with you um, and present in your life, in relationships and friendships, through art, um, in the beauty of creation. Um, the, the, the God is with us to the end of the age is not a statement that like, you know, Jesus is hanging out in your heart or whatever. I mean, obviously he is. Duh. I mean, yeah. But the affirmation of God's presence to be with us is something uh, that can win love, attentiveness, and presence is unacknowledged. You can feel alone and you're not. Parents know about that. Your parents, like you and your kids, like, you don't even care for me. You don't love me. You're, you don't even want to do good for me. And you're like, what are you talking about? I'm going to ground you because nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but parents understand it. Like, you've had that experience. So, one of the challenges you can give your congregation and give yourself is to say, like, let's pause, let's take time, let's give attention to the way in which Christ is present. Because when your anxiety lowers, when your un- identity is not a threat because the God who raised Christ from the dead is present with you, then it's a lot easier to face life, to wrestle honestly with the teachings and challenge of Jesus, right? The life of faith is 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 difficult it's even more difficult when you feel uh, when you feel alone and unattended to and christ has already promised to be with us so how is christ with you and once you start to name it and cultivate gratitude the eyes of faith get better at recognizing spotting the presence of the divine and then the flip side of that is how can we be the presence of christ one to another i think it's a beautiful challenge for trinity sunday the end, you could do that and drop it, though, some participating in God, some perichoresis and junk, and then say, like, the gift of being the body of Christ, being baptized into all three persons is that you are consciously aware that God is the God of love who intends to give God's self for the world, to the world, so the world may come to participate in God free of sin, law, death, and all the things that private, disturb, and pervert the relationship God has intended for God with all creation. It's an invitation to, to, to know that your true identity is one that exists in the divine life itself. The Trinitarian doctrine is not just, oh, we had to figure out how Father, Son, and Spirit get together because they're all baptized or whatever. The doctrine of the Trinity comes from the church insisting that the fullness of the one true and good God fully participated and was present in through the body of Jesus. And continues to be, and that what God gave in Christ in this material encounter was not just an intervention into a world bereft of God, but the eruption of God's intention for the world. So Jesus is the first fruits, right? And the other fruit is ripening and to be born in us and in the world and in creation. And so, boom, there you go. That's a Trinity bit. I wasn't even planning that. Yeah. That's very, you could, you could totally find some Moltmann lines because everyone knows all the cool kids smile when you quote some Moltmann at the end of junk. Mm hmm. That's what I'm talking about. The, uh, the other thing that popped in my head about, um, the, the Matthew passage is, uh, in a number of the questions you could really get to it, the way in which we as a church see our identity and its relationship to the kingdom of God, um, and that a lot of times the church uh, misses its uh, provisional understanding. It takes this declaration uh, of going you know, out into the world as some, some sense like justifying a divine monopoly or whatnot. Um, and I think differentiating, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, it's always talking about kingdom of heaven this, kingdom of heaven that. Realize that like, the church and this mission – is not an end in, uh, an end to itself. We're called, and, and the reason 
Jesus is like, baptize them, teach them to obey what I've done, is because God's desire is for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. You know, where God, God's desire, dream for the world, uh, is, uh, is made present through our corresponding faithfulness to the God who's ever faithful. So the taking some time in a text like this that's usually attached to the church's mission, right, sent out, and differentiate that. No, we're to create disciples who are faithful to God's dream for the world, the kingdom of heaven. And that may or may not correspond to our building campaign. Um, yeah, anyway, so there's that. All right, so, um, you know, I know Daniel. Daniel gets these done shorter. But see, I, I get excited in my little five words that I thought <laughs> they were going to trigger my thoughts for Matthew. Got me going, and I started talking. So uh, I'm sorry um, if, it's, if it's too long for your prep procrastination. But we're going to go to Psalm 8 because I like Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And this is, again, a short one, so I don't know why we're not going to read the Bible here. Um, I'm not going to read the Genesis 1 text, all right? But we'll do Psalm 8. Ah, uh, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have found a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. Mm. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? And yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, wherever passes along the paths of the sea. Our Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Okay, so maybe I'm changing my mind. I might, I might preach this one, and if I did, I, I, I got a few questions that would drive, drive my sermon. Uh, first is the closing and opening line. Like this, okay, I think that this psalm is one, it's a psalm of orientation, um, as Brueggemann talks about it, it's one, uh, I think, and part of its formative practice when you're singing it is it teaches us to understand the world as creation. And I think it's important to differentiate the two, but it might just be a difference that theologians obsess with. Right, but everyone sees the world. It's all the things that appear before us we encounter and engage. But the world can become creation. We identify, understand, interpret, receive the world as creation. That transformation, I think, is something the psalm's inviting us into. It's orienting our interpretation and encounter with existence and life to encounter a world that is creation, creation of the one good God, our Lord, whose name is majestic in all the earth. And so it's not God generic. Like, oh, Lord, our sovereign. We're talking about the divine name, the God who gave God's name Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that whole story, the name that is this giant story of fidelity, the one that, you know, freaks everyone out when it's like Moses, like who should I say is calling? And then you get the, I am who I'll be, I am who I am, I am what I am. That one, that God who has been faithful, covenanted, hesed, faithful love to the people of Israel, that's the one who's sovereign and whose name is majestic. So it's important, I think, to say that here, the identification of the world as a creation of the good God of Israel is not something that the the world naturally imposes upon you. When you look at the world, it does not, the text is not saying, you know, you get to the top of a mountain, there's a sunset, and you you say, obviously, the Trinity that's not what the text is talking about. And I think it's important to get that because as a Christian, right, when I like hiked out, get a beautiful moment, you're like, boom. And you're like this. This is a gift of God. Um, or you have a like moment where a friend forgives you. And you're like, praise the Lord. Or what, you know, like we, we need to recognize this isn't saying that the creation itself demands a response to the one whose name we know from history encounters in that relationship, um, that that the encounter with God in God's history, a salvation and presence in history in our in the community of Israel, uh, is one where because of how God has shown up and been faithful 
the world becomes creation. And this is a connection, I think, that's important to the Genesis text, uh, the cr- first creation story. Um, Gerhard von Rod, in his commentary on Genesis, points this out, that uh, the creation stories are kind of like a uh, – they, they were like the required setup for the real deal, right? Like God's redemption of Israel, God's liberation of the people, God's redemptive encounter, covenanting connection between Abraham, Sarah, and company, like that, that's front street. But then once you realize that you have encountered the one good life-giving God, then you got to get a preface. And so you, you tell these creation stories, you know, uh, that makes sense. But the identification of the world as a creation of the one good God who made the world and calls it good is a theological conclusion you get to after you've encountered God or known and loved and cherished and, 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 and redeemed by God. Uh, the, the kind of the theology of creation is a retroactive uh, concept. And I think um, when we read this psalm, uh, it, it's inviting us, it's cultivating the language, the prism, the, the spectacles of seeing the world as creation. And that's where, why it's connected to the name. The, name. the other thing in it, um, the question, like that wasn't even one of my questions, actually. I have to tell you, I just thought of it, seeing the world as creation. And I was like, oh, I'll say something about that. And then minutes went by. Sorry. My question, uh, the first question is, um, um, God's good creation in here. He says, you've set your glory above the heavens. Like you get this sense in here and in the creation text that God it creates in part by creating boundaries and creating habits. And what these boundaries and habits of the good creating God do is allow life to flourish, Right? You know, put water here, land here, or you set your glory above the heavens, and you got like heavens here, earth here, and that kind of thing. And that well, the 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 order and structure of the existence that gives the context for this creative uh, living interaction is a uh, um, it's it that space comes from uh, that. Uh, having the proper boundaries, having the c- proper order is a necessary part for creation. It's like a uh, blues music, right? It's really simple music, but you do it so that then you can, you can go on the solos and, and rock it out. You can bend a note where your face looks like it's hurting and everyone knows you're hurting because it's blues music and you're supposed to look kind of constipated while you play it or like jazz music. I mean, like music is one of those things you have structure and order and things, but it's so that creativity can flourish. But then you could say, I think that's a good question. We look at it in our world and a lot of us, a lot of us want more life to exist in our own lives, in our family, in our world and stuff, and yet we are uncomfortable with creating uh, habits and boundaries for God's creative work that happens within them to take place. Um, so, yeah, talk about habits and boundaries and what happens in, in, in the spaces. Um, the other thing is uh, the, the, the passage about, like, when I look at the heavens and the work and, you know, I see God and stuff, I think one of the questions is, uh, what is it like to go God spotting? Right, like I I live in Los Angeles. Um, before I started teaching full time, I worked at a rather large UCC church with a lot of people you know that are in creative the industry and such. And um, one of the things I learned from a friend of mine there that uh, does uh, cinematography is uh, like part of the gift of cinematography is learning how to spot the energy. In a scene, really, you could have like the perfect take, like perfect script, perfect acting and all that kind of stuff. But if you don't know how to capture the energy of the scene, it, it could feel wrong. Right. And, and, and we describe it. And and uh, one time we were we were doing this uh, series of uh, an experiment. We would do these experiments for, you know, um, we'd have a small group. Let's do an experiment in truth. Let's do like a month where we're going to cultivate this discipline, this habit, this practice. And we we were in a group of dads um, trying to cultivate gratitude. And he came up with what we were going to do. It's the first couple, uh, you know, first time you get together. We know we're coming. We're going to cultivate gratitude together. First couple of weeks I have kind of planned. And then it becomes more led for the second half with the participants. And he came up with this activity called God spotting. And he tells us, you know, like find the energy in the scene and all that kind of stuff. And he says, you know, once you know how to see it, then you know how to see it and you can get it. 
Um, but you don't until you really learn the art of spotting the energy, the center of energy in a scene. You know, you're just you're just taking pictures. You're not making a film. And he said, I think God's like finding God's presence in our life is a lot like that. Uh, so what if part of our gratitude isn't like a beginning and ending day thing? Um, let's cultivate gratitude along. And maybe like when you're cultivating gratitude, part of it is going God spotting throughout your day, like the way in which the goodness of God is made manifest. Can you learn to hone your life, your eyes on that? And so like when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? It's a beautiful psalm. But a lot of us can look at the same heavens, the same moon and stars and go, what were you thinking? This is not the best put together universe. The sun's going to swallow us at some point. Like you can already hear it. You know, it's like Debbie Downer of the, of the stars. The stars don't change, but our experience of it does. Depending on what you learn to put the energy, the scene, the God spotting element, put the camera on. And so I think I would use this. And as a, as someone that tends towards the hypercritical uh, with nihilistic undertones, I could do a good job explaining how that is the cheesiest, naive version of looking at the stars ever. And then go, but what if it's the most life-giving thing to cultivate? And then I would like pull out stories of some of the most brilliant scientists who do the same thing when describing like quantum mechanics or stuff like that. And say, like, it's not actually about the world. It's about creation, seeing the world as creation, as a gift of the good God who knows your name, knows your face, and cares. Um, if you want to do it, the second half about like the whole like dominion, uh, we have dominion over things, as God has made us a little lower than angels, and uh, there you can talk about uh, ecological responsibility, how the problematic, the notion of dominion has turned into, uh, because it's a dignity to have dominion here. It, it, it is a uh, a vocational um, connection to like uh, uh, to God and God's identity as creator that we're cooperating, participating consciously in being a steward of existence and life, um, and that uh, the text is one where I think you could draw a strong contrast between the picture here of dominion in which the livingness of living things uh, is acknowledged, right? You, you talk about all the beasts in the field when it talks about ox and sheep and the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. The way it describes it are, are all these living participants in the world, in the place where they live. We have pulled most animals that are on this planet are domesticated and don't live any existence similar to what they were intended to do. Right, cows were not made never to move, be pumped up with with drugs, and sit and have a miserable, painful life before they're turned into our food. The birds of the air cough. <laughs> the fish of the sea are like, have y'all thought about not having so many bags, and maybe don't just throw junk. So I feel like you know you can you you can get to unpacking the ways in which we have perverted the notion of our 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 responsibility to 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 the to the life across the world um because we have actually destroyed um the very air and sea and land and fields in which they live and we perverted their own vocations by making them serve simply us our 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 uh, carnivore consumption industry and addiction or or or, or our addiction to 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 products that leave pollution there and we're like bump that birds like you can see how this could go and and you you could do that and be like, yeah, I know the psalm's pretty, but it's Trinity Sunday, and I I'm I'm not that Trinitarian, so I went with the psalm, and I'm going straight eco justice on this junk. I don't know if you do that, don't say Trip told me to. I'm just saying that question came up because it puts the animals in their uh, uh, um space in the text, 
And then what happens when he describes these uh, all the living things which we have been given the responsibility to care for from God? It ends like by saying, oh, Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And that includes the air and the sea and the fields. And I'm going to guess that God's name is not that majestic if you are like torturing animals as part of our um, our food habits or you're polluting the air and the birds can't sing because they're hacking up loogies. And you know what I mean? I'm not saying you say that in a sermon. I'm just saying the text asks that question. Is God's sovereignty being tended to, are we being responsible to it? Is the majesty of the one who made the world uh, need need new help because we suck? Yeah. No, nah, I'm just saying. Daniel's going to be like, you said suck on the Lectio cast. And now my, now, look, Daniel, here's the thing. I don't want them to be sad when I leave. You know what I mean? Uh, you're just being a good family man. Road trip. I'm just trying to help out, all right? And this is green time, green season. You see, it's like the off season for the master of Lectio cast. All right, last thing, the Genesis text. Genesis 1. Um, I, I also originally thought this would be the one I preached, but then I decided not to because I know if I preached it, I would basically be talking about Catherine Keller. <laughs> if you don't know who she is, you can go listen to her talk about her book, The Face of the Deep, um, on homebrewed Christianity. I did an interview with her about it a couple of years ago. Um, but she wrestles with this text. And ever since then, like, uh, it, okay, that book is so good. I know people that disagree with her that are like, but still, that, book's, that book rocks. You know what I mean? They're like, I don't, I, you know, she argues against creation out of nothing. I have some friends. They love creation out of nothing, which is like a weird doctrine to get really into, but they do. And, and they're like, but still, still face of the deep. Keller rocks it. Like one of my friends, he's an Orthodox priest. He's like, if you were going to part ways with the historic Orthodox church's position on the nature of God and creation, um, and deny the prior actuality of God, then that's got to be the best way of doing it. Cause it's so good. <laughs> That's not how he sounds. I changed his voice so that he, I didn't ask because I just thought of that right now. So I, I don't, I don't want, I, I don't want, um, I don't want him to know it was him until I get permission. All right. So maybe next week I'll tell you his real name and use his real voice because he has a higher pitch voice than that. Anyway, let me just tell you a few things that, uh, that, that Keller points out that makes this text tons of fun. And even, even if you don't like everything she says in, or you're at a church where, um, that it could be a little, a little, uh, overly contentious, then you can, you could still just, just hear it and you might go, yeah, but it's worth it. I'm going to Keller it up anyway. So here's the deal. Creation out of nothing. You read the text. It says in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Okay, you read that. It does not sound like there was nothing and then God made things. I'm Okay, there's a passage in Romans that people say means creation out of nothing. I don't think it does, but go for it. It's great if it does. Um, and the doctrine could be correct and it not be necessarily in the Bible. I just want to say that now, not trying to have a fight. I'm going to officially have no opinion about it right here because I just want to tell you that if you weren't down for creation out of nothing, this would be a fun way of reading it and bringing it up in the congregation. Um, so, yeah. So here's the thing. Creation out of nothing, uh, is what Keller's going to argue, sunders the fundamental relationality of the world and establishes unilateral repressive power structures. If creation is is a one-way street, then it problematizes a world in which interrelationality uh, is, is how the world works. It models from creation a singular top-down um, coercive image of power. And, um, and you must be saying to yourself, well, duh, because there's like God in the world and God's awesome. God makes the world. Um, but here's the thing. Um, where did the origin of this idea come from? And if you start to look at uh, – a number of different feminist theorists, they point to the way um, uh, the in not just the Bible or something, but like in ancient texts of creation, you constantly see this desire, this kind of masculine desire to do away and cover over the feminine. Um, you, you, you see a rejection of this interwoven world. And uh, in, in here, 
you get rid of the primal C, right? When you read creation out of nothing in this text, there's this primal C sitting there and it, it, it's there and God engages it for creative action. God's spirit is the creative power uh, that brings uh, things about. But um, when you do creation out of nothing, the feminine part of this image of creation um, turns either into nothing, that's one option, uh, so it just didn't exist, or it becomes evil. And those are the different options that happen in just like literature of creation. And what um, uh, Keller kind of points out is that uh, if you look at the text, you see like the depths as one element there, the tehum. You have the creative power, the rah, the breath, the spirit, the the, uh, the reality of God, and then you have the image of the highest God, Elohim, um, which she describes as a plura singularity. Uh huh. It's a pluralizing singularity, a pluralizing ularity. You know, she likes to come up with really cool words, but a plural a singularity that pluralizes. And I think it's a beautiful image. So you have like the sea, the tehom, the formless uh, void, the earth, are there prior in Genesis to anything else. They were the beginning. You have a sea, you have a void. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and the darkness covered the face of the deep. You have three different things just sitting there. You got God, you got a void, you got a formless void, you got a sea, the tehom. And they're they're sitting there, and so God is this, uh, in a sense, comes second. Is the creatively act, is creatively active with the chaos of the sea, uh, the spirit over the water. The text does not say God creates them. It actually says that God creates within them, like within the, within the depths and the sea comes the spirit of God, and then. Um, the story of creation begins to emerge and it emerges uh, this this primal chaos isn't depicted in genesis as a threat to creation but the very place creation takes place is in the chaos that junk will preach the very place that creation takes place is in the midst of chaos because when you're filled with the spirit of god the spirit don't run the spirit creates it gives life it brings life out of this chaotic womb of the world and the womb of the world this creative chaos that encounters the spirit of god is not something to be t- tamed and determined is something to be creatively engaged so that life can come forth i mean that is a beautiful, beautiful picture. Primal chaos is the womb of possible potentialities, and the Spirit of God engages it, cooperates with it, moves underneath it, and brings creation into existence. Boom! That junk can preach because guess what? All of us have chaos in our lives. And if God is found creating and bringing new things into being by creative, redemptive encounters in the midst of chaos, not conquering it, but opening it up to new depths and new possibilities than the Spirit of God, which brings life into existence. is something we can find in the midst of our chaos, and our chaos in our lives is not something to be suppressed and denied, but seen as an opportunity for a new transformative encounter with the Spirit of God that hovers over the water. If the world is a great ocean, life is a risk, it's a, but it's a creative risk. But God isn't found in the destruction of the chaos, but in the midst of the process itself. And then, look, Genesis literally means the coming. You know, in the book this is in. And The primordial chaos there in Genesis from which creation comes, from which it births, reveals that chaos is not this evil but our womb. And it contrasts deeply with the Enuma Elish, which some people, I wouldn't use that in the sermon unless you want to. I'm not going to talk about the Enuma Elish because I already know I've gone over and I'm still excited. But I'm saying the Tehomic death, the depth, the depth of the Tehom, for all of its chaotic risk, is not evil. The open-ended interactivity of the process of creation exposes us to suffering and evil, but it also 
makes great good possible. And sometimes it will take uh, serious discernment for us to be able to tell the difference between suffering, evil, and goodness because life happens and it keeps happening. The living and life-giving God comes in the midst of chaos, and chaos is the womb of possibility, not something to be conquered. There's this dynamic interaction that's there, and when God is the in the midst of the process, then it makes life uh, this creative endeavor uh, you see depicted in Genesis amazing. Why? Because every time new things come, God says it's good, it's good, it's good. And then over the, the days, it's not just like good and God walks away, good, God walks away. Then all of creation that has come into being through this dynamic interaction starts to participate. So God says, let the earth put forth vegetation, right? So over the days, as as uh, as creation comes to have more uh, com- complex- complexity, uh, more dynamics within it, more uh, uh, deeper subjectivity of life, then the um, the interaction between God and the world deepens all the way that you may get human beings. Uh, and, and God says, these are good, very good. And guess what? Humans. You can hear the story. You can write this poem. Um, you have a responsibility. This entire dynamic engagement of God in the world that brings about this deepening of possibility for creative interactions leads to us being in a situation where we can consciously and intentionally live responsibly with integrity with this living and life-giving God. To do so doesn't mean we need to then reread the whole story and find out Uh, The chaos is something to be conquered. No, no, no. It's the very place that God's found. That's where creation happens. And when you do it, and you do it with God, it can be good. It can be very good. And then after that, it's Sabbath time. And you rest. So that's why I like the Sabbath part. God had to take a day off. You say that? And God didn't have to. God chose to. You know what I mean? I love the image of Sabbath. Like, if God recognizes the necessity of rest and that that is an intrinsic part of the rhythm of creative existence, then we should attune to it. And I have a seeking, a little lurching suspicion that if human beings cultivate genuine Sabbath, where we check out of the economy, expectations, and pace of regular existence, then the chaos of the day-to-day can become less of a threat to our being. It won't. It doesn't have to be a threat. It can be the very place that when we're engaged, the spirit thrives. So maybe I am maybe I preach that now. I don't know. Nonetheless, this has been the Lectio cast. And I hope you preach one of those three because 2 Corinthians 13 talks about holy kisses. And you can't do that without making everyone kiss. All right? Smoochie boochies.